Welcome back to Alex's ESL World. I'm Alex and today I'm going to talk to you about intonation and word stress. Have you ever noticed that English is spoken with a lot of rising and falling tones when we speak? Is your language very flat when you speak? This is something I think people don't notice about their own language, but it's something they notice when another language is different from theirs in this way. When I was in grad school studying to be an ESL teacher, I was told that English is a very sing-songy language. I thought that was ridiculous, and I thought to myself, no, it isn't. And then I heard myself and I thought, it is. As I learned more about my own language, I've realized how important correct intonation is in the English language. Some languages, such as Japanese and Korean, are usually very flat. I taught some Korean public school teachers one year in South Korea. When I first arrived there, I was studying the language as much as I could. One of my first students told me, Alex, if you want to speak Korean well, you need to speak it very flat. I said, you mean I should say, 안녕하세요? He said, yes, that's great. I knew he wasn't right. 안녕하세요 means hello. When I walk into my favorite cosmetics store, young women always greet me with, 안녕하세요. I guess he hadn't gone into the face shop. In Korean, they do speak much flatter than we do in English. In English, we put intonation patterns in every word and every sentence we speak. And if we use the incorrect intonation pattern, sometimes we are not understood. In fact, sometimes we communicate only with intonation. For example, if I say, uh-huh, do you know what I mean? I mean, yes, right? And if I say, uh-uh, you probably know I mean no. What if we do this? Mm. This one means, I don't know. Mm. You know that, especially if my shoulders go up like this when I make that sound. The point is that intonation is so important in English that you might perfectly pronounce a word, but if your intonation is wrong, a native speaker might not understand you. I'm going to start with word stress. First, you have to understand what a syllable is. That's the beat of a word. For example, if I say the word tree, how many syllables do you think it has? It has three different sounds, t, er, and e, but it only has one syllable. Tree, tree, one syllable. Let's try another one. Basket, basket, basket. This one has two syllables. Let's try one more. Banana. What do you think? Banana. This one has three syllables. Some languages count syllables differently. Be sure you understand what I mean when I talk about syllables. Okay, so you know what a syllable is. Here's why you need to know that. In English, when we have a word with two or more syllables, one of them will be stressed or it'll be stronger than the others. It also has the highest pitch for musical people, you understand that pitch is the highness or lowness of a sound. La, that's a high sound. That's a high pitched. And la, that's a low pitch or a low note. So when I say banana, can you hear that the second syllable, nan, is stronger and higher pitched than the first, ba, and the last? No. Nah. I guess that's what makes English sing-songy. So, with words with two or more syllables, we're going to need to give one syllable more stress than the others. Let's look at some examples. Guess which syllable is stressed in a quiz I used to give my students. See if you can guess them all right. Which syllable is normally stressed? Number one, is photographer. Photographer. Is it the first syllable, the second syllable, the third syllable, or the fourth? Photographer. I hope you said the second syllable. Photographer. 
Let's try another one. Autograph. Autograph. What do you think? First, second, or third? You said first, right? Great, you're right. Listen carefully. Number three is necessary. Necessary. Which syllable? The first one, of course. I hope you got that one. Here's another with four syllables. Authority. Authority. What do you think? If you said second, you got it right. Authority. Let's keep going. Number five is humility. Humility. What's this one? That one is the second syllable. I hope you've got it now. How about theatrical? Theatrical. Think about it. This one is also the second syllable. Theatrical. Can you hear it? Okay, don't get scared. You can do this one. There are six syllables here, and actually two syllables have some stress, but only one has the main stress. Are you ready? Here goes. Theatricality. 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 Do you have it? The most stressed syllable is the fourth syllable. That was a hard one. Give yourself a pat on the back if you got that one. Do you know pat on the back? It's a good thing. Number eight is politics. Politics. This one's easier than the last one. Are you ready? It's the first syllable. Politics. Next, we have empathize. Empathize. What do you think? You should be an expert by now. The first syllable in empathize is the stressed one. And for your last word, we have adaptable. Adaptable. Got it? Adaptable has the second syllable as the most stressed. So how did you do? Did you get them all right? Let's take a look at what can happen when you use the incorrect intonation in a word. How would you read this sentence? It looks like the last two words are the same word repeated, but that's not the case. The first of these is a verb. The farm was used to produce. Notice that the second syllable is stressed here, produce. The last word in the sentence is a noun, and it's pronounced produce. It means fresh fruits and vegetables. So this sentence would sound like, the farm was used to produce produce. How about this one? This time there's a difference between the first one, polish, which is a verb, and the second one, polish, which is an adjective. You can see that polish is capitalized. That's because the adjective is about something that came from the country Poland. We always capitalize this kind of adjective. So the correct pronunciation of this sentence is, we must polish the Polish furniture. That's some fancy furniture, don't you think? So there are words that look the same, but are pronounced differently depending on the part of speech. I'll show you some groups of nouns and verbs that look the same, but have different stressed syllables. I'll start with this one. As you can see, a present is a gift. Present. And to present means to show something, to make a presentation, like I'm doing right now. I'm presenting this lesson to you. Of course, present has other meanings. To be present, which is an adjective, means that you're here. You are present. But I don't want to confuse you with all the ways you can use this word. Let's go to the next one. A reject is something you don't want. For example, these donuts didn't turn out, out as beautifully as the baker wanted them to, so they're now rejects. Do you think we could get those for a good price? The verb means just what you think it would. Those donuts were rejected. 
So is this man who just asked the woman to marry him. Oh no, she rejected him, poor man. A similar pair of words like this is object and object. An object can be anything. It's like the word thing. To object means to say you disagree with or you oppose something. It's like when a lawyer in a court hears something from his opponent and he stands up and says, I object. Yes, I like watching legal dramas like Law and Order. There are many words like this in English, so be sure when you learn a word, you learn the correct stressed syllable. Now, in addition to making the correct stressed syllables, there's a lot of meaning in which words in sentences are stressed. This changes depending on the meaning you want to express. Stressed words are the most important words in a sentence. These are the words you most want to communicate. For example, if I have a new friend and she tells me she's a baker, I love baked goods. You know, breads and pastries are the best. So I might ask her, where do you work? You can see the intonation indicated above the sentence. Hmm. <laughs> I used this intonation because the most important information to me is where she works. Maybe her reply would be, I work at King's Bakery. Notice that King's is the most important word and the word that gets the stress. The answer to my question is King's Bakery, not any other bakery. What if she asked me the same question? Where do you work? We've already established that we're talking about work. Now she wants to know where I work. So you will be the stressed word. Where do you work? If she had asked me, where do you work? Like I asked her, I'd be confused. I'd wonder, why is she asking me like this? If we already, uh, you know, knew we were talking about work. When we establish the topic of a sentence, we don't need to continue to stress that word. We do that to bring attention to the important word, the word that shows what we're talking about. So once we know what our topic is, we put stress on the word that asks for new information. That's why she would ask me, where do you work? We know our topic is work, and we know where she works, but she doesn't know where I work. The important thing here is to put emphasis on the word that's the most important word in the sentence to get the meaning that we're trying to communicate. Here's an example I got from my daughters when they were little. They came home one day laughing and talking about pigs flying. Do pigs fly? Is this a real thing? Do they? Do pigs fly compared to other animals? Do pigs fly? I thought they only walked and ran. I was going to stop at the pigs flying example, but a friend of mine shared this chart with me that shows even better what I'm talking about here. It comes from another ESL website that's been around a lot longer than mine. I've used this site in the past for lessons. It's the English Grammar Club, English Grammar Club. The link is at the bottom of the chart, www.english.social. They've taken one sentence, I didn't say he had stolen my bike and they've made eight different meanings depending on which word is emphasized or stressed. The chart states they made seven, but actually there are eight different meanings here. I'm gonna read each one and talk about the meanings. First, I didn't say he had stolen my bike. Someone else did, but not me. I didn't say he had stolen my bike. Maybe I was accused of saying this, but it's not true. I didn't say it. I didn't say he had stolen my bike. Maybe I implied or hinted that he had stolen my bike. We might do this if we know who did it, but we don't have any proof. I didn't say he had stolen my bike. I said that someone did, but I didn't say who. I didn't see, say he had stolen my bike. I said maybe he thought about stealing it, but not that he had. I didn't say he had stolen my bike. I said he took it. 
Maybe he was only borrowing it. I didn't say he had stolen my bike. I said he stole someone's bike. I didn't say he had stolen my bike. I said he stole something of mine. I want to go back to talking about questions. Different kinds of questions uh, use different intonation. There are two basic types of questions in English. There's the yes-no question and the WH question. Yes-no questions just ask for a yes or a no answer. For example, if I ask you, are you studying English? Your answer would be yes. At least I hope it would be. But the question has some rising and falling intonations. Listen again. Pay attention to the intonation pattern in this question. Are you studying English? When we ask yes-no questions, we usually end the question with a rising intonation, like you see here in my diagram. Let's do one more. Listen carefully. Do you like pizza? If I hum this question, you'll be able to hear the intonation without the distraction of the words. Listen to this. The exception is when we're stressing some other word in the question, like I did with the flying pig questions. Usually, the last syllable is the most stressed in yes-no questions. WH questions are the ones we use to request particular information. The WH questions are who, what, where, when, which, why, and how. I know, how doesn't start with a WH, but it's still a WH word. Let's look at some WH questions. Who is visiting this website? Listen again for the intonation. Who is visiting this website? Now look at the intonation pattern. You can hear that who is a higher pitch than the rest of the sentence. That's because it's the information we're looking for. It's important. The word website, <clears throat> website is almost as important. So the first syllable, web, is a little more stressed. But the last syllable, site, drops. That's how we end WH questions. Who is visiting this website? Next one. What are you studying? What are you studying? Again, what is the most important? That's because that's the kind of information we're asking for. Studying is important because that's the specific type of thing we're asking about. The intonation can vary in these questions a little, but the last syllable is always the lowest point, or the lowest pitch. Where are you going? Do you hear that last syllable? Going. Sometimes we end up with a scratchy sound because we're taking that last syllable so low. We call it vocal fry. Some people do this so much it's really annoying. Annoying, like that. When did you start learning English? There's a slight emphasis in the first word because it's important, but the main stress is in the word English. But we have to drop that last syllable to a lower pitch because it's a WH question. Which fruit should I buy? Here, fruit is the important word, so that's the word that gets the stress. How do I make my website better? That's a question I'm always working on. So here, how is important and website is important. Website is the most important word in the sentence. So that will have the highest pitch. Listen again. How do I make my website better? I've given you an overview of intonation in words and questions, but really every sentence has a high point and a low point. Do you know the difference between content words and function words? Content words are the ones with the most meaning. Function words are the ones we use to put the content words together. Words like a, an, and the, 
which are articles, and of, for, in, and at, which are prepositions. These are function words. The most important words in a sentence are the stressed words. These are usually content words. There's one more kind of question I want to mention here, and that's tag questions. These are questions we put at the end of a sentence, such as, You speak English, don't you? I'm bringing this up because there are two ways we can add stress to that tag, don't you? And they mean two different things. The first pattern is when the intonation goes up, at the end like this. You speak English, don't you? When you use this intonation pattern, you really don't know if the person speaks English or not. You think they might, but you're not so sure. The other intonation pattern is where you drop down to a lower pitch when you say, you speak English, don't you? When the intonation goes down at the end of a tag question, it means we're pretty sure we know the answer. In this case, we're almost certain that you speak English. You speak English, don't you? Maybe you had a friend in your country who you just heard speaking with someone in English. You didn't know before that that they spoke English, but you just heard them and they sounded really good. So you could say, you speak English, don't you? Let's practice with a couple of sentences. I'll say them, and you say if A, you're not so sure what the answer is, or B, you're pretty sure you know. Remember, if you're not sure, you will raise the pitch in the last syllable, just like you do with a normal yes-no question. If you lower the pitch at the end, you're pretty sure you know the answer to the question. Ready? Here goes. Aaron is an Irish name, isn't it? The answer is A. We're not sure at all. Maybe it's British or Scottish. Next. We have homework, don't we? That one is B. Of course we have homework. We have homework every night. Next. English is easy, isn't it? That's B. Of course it is. Well, maybe not for everyone. But that's the intonation pattern I used. I hope you got them all right. And that's the end of this lesson. My advice to you is to listen carefully to native English speakers and pay attention to the up and down sounds in English. Try to imitate those intonation patterns. Remember that if your intonation is incorrect, we might not understand what you're trying to say. This is Alex, and I hope you've learned something useful from this lesson. Goodbye for now, and remember to be kind to each other. Bye.